Hey everyone, I'm Lee Jen here along with Nathan Bachez, and this is Means of Creation, a show where we are deep diving into the passion economy and the future of work. This show is made by Every, which is a writer's collective focused on business. And recently we've had a recurring theme on this podcast, which is around how we can build for creator and user empowerment, i.e. how we actually bake that into product design itself versus just paying lip service to creator empowerment. Um, the last generation of marketplaces and platforms really had to extract from users and take a take rate in order to monetize. But we're really keen to explore what new developments and new technology enables for us to explore potentially different business models that remain aligned with participants of platforms. So in that vein, I'm really excited today to welcome our guests because they are building a radically different alternative, a talent network that's user owned with aligned incentives that redistributes value back to its participants. So we're really excited to have Gabe Ostaseski and Adam Jackson with us today. Adam is a co-founder of Brain Trust and is a four-time venture-backed entrepreneur building marketplaces. His last company was Doctor On Demand. Gabe um, is the other co-founder of Brain Trust and also spent his career building and investing in marketplaces. He was a co-founder of Modernize, a marketplace in the home improvement category, and has also advised many marketplaces on growth, um, including Thumbtack, Uber, Lending Home, etc. So thank you guys so much for being here, Gabe and Adam. Really excited to have you on the show today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. So I've previously heard you guys talking about how the way that we work is broken, referring to centralized marketplaces. I'd love for you guys to unpack that and tell us more about what you mean by that statement. Maybe I'll hand that over to Adam. Oh, actually, Gabe's better on that one. Why don't you do okay. that, one, Gabe? Sounds good. <laughs> Is that Gabe, all right? <laughs> Gabe, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think if like if we we have a, a pretty short memory for this, but like I think that uh, if we look back in this like in this last decade. Um, there was this incredible new thing that came along, which now we know is called like the gig economy. And it came with this incredible promise for autonomy and freedom and entrepreneurship and this idea that you could essentially be your own boss. Um, and, and while that was really exciting and an incredible shine and some, some enormous companies were built around that, it also has kind of a dark underbelly as well. Uh, and while it was this incredible value creation event for the venture capitalists involved, in many cases, the the creators, the gig workers, the drivers, you know, the the delivery folks were largely extracted upon um, in the form of that take rate. And so, you know, in Uber's case, you have ten people that became deca billionaires, and you had the effective minimum wage get pushed down for drivers and people living out of their cars, literally. And so, I think while this had like had this incredible promise, it was essentially an economic disaster for the supply side and for the users of those networks. And so I think when I when I think about how work is evolving, you know, it used to be that you'd stay at the same job for 30 or 40 years, you collect a pension, right? And then you would be done with your work life and you would retire. And then what we started to see was kind of like the the modularizing of work and and like the turning work into these atomic units which gave way to the gig economy. And now we're seeing that accelerated even more with Web3 technology and DAOs and like micro work. Um, and so essentially this, like, this concept of work is essentially just being broken apart into its atomic units um, and enabling people to work the way that they want and engage the way that they want. So I think that's a really fascinating trend. Um, and I think we're, we're early still in its life cycle. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I think a lot of um, people, when they first hear that, they they definitely can relate to that issue of the take rates feeling unfair or having been determined by you know this third party for whom there's no ability to give feedback. But can you unpack how it's possible for Web three marketplaces to not have a take rate, like? How can they operate without revenue? How yeah. do decentralized marketplaces make money in that case? If you don't mind, Lee, I might zoom out and frame <laughs> Web3 sort of on a spectrum and, and then answer that question, if that's yeah, okay. that would be wonderful. Um, 
So, so the web two marketplaces, I mean, you can almost say like web one, like Craigslist was kind of the first web enabled marketplace and then eBay and then the whole host of web twos and all the way up to, you know, DoorDash and the giants of the gig economy. And you have on like there, these are for-profit corporations that operate and run these marketplaces. They're investor owned and those investors need a return, rightfully so, because they were risk on capital during the formation of these networks. Um, but as we know, you know, the higher the rake, the more incentive there is to disintermediate the operator, right? Which actually erodes network effects. And so um, there, it actually limits growth, right? And so there, there's like sort of framing of web two, web three sort of moves to invert that by making the users who make their living on the network, also the owners and operators of the network, right? And so that's how you can sort of get to a, a, a small take rate. I, I would even argue crypto has figured out, Web3 has figured out how to make a negative take rate by actually giving more tokens and more ownership and more control of that network to participants who are good actors, i.e. high reputation, always pay on time, five out of five for your job, whatever, right? And so you go from a rake too far, which is something Bill Gurley wrote about, years ago 2013 right he actually argued this is this these high rakes are near term greed that that mortgage your future you know to to web3 is figured out negative rake right like on brain trust you get you know get paid tokens when you do things like get an invoice paid or have a good reputation and so that i wanted to set up that paradigm first yeah the second the second point about about rake is you know not all rakes are the same right so i would say there's a spectrum of you know your rake, you know, is consummate with the value you deliver as a as an operator. Like, you're, so you're extracting as much as you're giving back, or you're giving back more than you extract. And then the other side of the spectrum is you're extracting way more than your than the value you're providing, right? And and so I'll give examples, right? Um, I would say Airbnb is a good example of a marketplace operator that probably gives. And provides as much value as it extracts. Uh, you know, it's amazing um, reputation and amazing UX and like check in, check out and insurance in case the place gets trashed. And, you know, it's like they're a really good ecosystem, right? And so you don't see a lot of people like really trying to disintermediate them. On the other side, it would be, you know, I would say the whole gig economy, basically, um, and, and including like Upwork and Fiverr. Um, where I, I would say the food, the last mile gig economy, the only real innovation they had, this is kind of what Gabe was saying earlier, is they figured out how to make low wage workers work for even less money, hmm. right? It, it was not a technical innovation, right? It's not that hard to have to build DoorDash, Postmates, Uber Eats. It's technologically trivial now, um, but they figured out how to lower the minimum wage from fifteen to five dollars an hour, which is, you know. Right, you're uh, referring to the employment classification that they're exactly. Leveraging. Yeah, George, right. Georgetown Georgetown actually did a study on this, and they they figured out what what Uber drivers' actual take home pay was, and it was about five bucks an hour. And so, aside from being like morally abhorrent, it's bad for business, right? I think if one or more sides of your marketplace hates the operator, it's time for disruption, right? You've got a, a nice window there. So um, that's kind of the. So I would say like the folks who are on the more egregious end of that take rate spectrum are, are lower hanging fruit for Web3. Gotcha. But yeah, I'm curious. I think this would be a good point to talk through kind of brain trust, what your model is, maybe some of the other models that exist. We don't have to name names, but uh, that, that maybe have higher mm -hmm. rakes and how you can get by with zero rake, you know, whereas obviously it's, you got to generate some sort of return in order to pay for running the platform and yeah. return something to the investors and all that. So like, I think, I think it'd be a good, good time to go into that. Yeah. yeah happy to take that one. So at its core, what, what brain trust is, is a decentralized talent network that connects mostly large enterprises, Nestle, Porsche, uh, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs, folks like that with the technical talent that they need to innovate. So, software engineers, designers, product managers, project managers, folks like that. Those are kind of the core categories we started with. It, obviously, it continues to expand categorically. Right. Um, and then when you think about like, what are the, why do people join and why do they stay? Um, so the value props for talent is, is pretty straightforward. Number one is they get to work with like the largest brands in the world. 
And if you're right. a developer in the Ukraine or if you're a developer even in San Francisco, like getting through procurement to work with a Goldman Sachs, like they're never going to do that for one person, but they can do that with a network. So you basically get access to, de to demand for your services that you could never have gotten before. Uh, the second thing is that they're large and ongoing jobs. So like on Upwork, the average job size, I think it's like 280 bucks. And, and we just actually calculated this yesterday. The average job site on Braintrust last month was $76,000. Um, and so they get large ongoing work, which makes it like much easier for people to jump ship from like a traditional job and work here because they know that they have like more income security. Um, and then the, the third part is that if they've been working on a marketplace, typically they're paying 30, sometimes 40% rakes to the incumbent marketplaces, whether that's a TopTal or an Upwork or Fiverr. The, the fees and rates vary, but I'll just say like they've been paying a pretty hefty tax. Mm -hmm. And when they come to Braintrust, they pay 0%. So they get anywhere from a 15% to 40% raise immediately by just joining. So there's a really strong financial incentive for them to join. Yeah. And then the last part is, is this thing that's, well, it used to be a little bit more nuanced when we were first starting, which was, this concept of governance and control, right? And that was a pretty abstract idea up until the point when we were on mainnet and we started to have, you know, governance proposals get submitted. I think there was 10 in the last month, which is that, you know, for people that own tokens, we have a one token, one vote system and, and people can propose adjustments to the protocol, enhancements to, uh, or changes to the fee structure, anything that that is responsible for the protocol the users, the, the, the B-Trust token holders can control that. And that, that means quite a lot when you run your company or essentially you run your business on these platforms. Um, creators do care quite about quite a bit about that. So that's like the value props for the talent side. And on the, on the enterprise side and on the company side, like the simple way to say it is like every company now is a tech company <laughs> and they're all in a war for talent that they can never win. Um, because the nature of the work that is being done by Nestle or Porsche or Goldman Sachs is increasingly more and more technical. And there's just frankly not enough technical people in the 20 miles around your office that, that could be hired. Right. And so the first thing is just access, right? The second is actually quality. So we have a really intense vetting process where it's actually done peer to peer, community member to community member. And and so the higher rates are typically like 25 to 50% of the people that get matched versus normally they have to sift through a hundred resumes to interview one person. Um, and then the third part is, um, is if they have access and they have really high quality, the third is kind of the trifecta, which is most of these companies, these big enterprises, they're used to working with like the Accentures of the world or the PWCs of the world. And the way that those management consultant firms work is they work on a, on a markup. So it's a little bit different than a than like a marketplace rake where they take a rake out of the transaction. They actually like black black box the amount that the engineer gets paid. So so I'll give you a good example. Like a big company will pay like a PwC or an Accenture like four hundred and seventy five dollars an hour for a JavaScript developer, and the JavaScript developer keeps seventy five bucks, and everything else is all markup. And so the employers know that and the talent knows it. And, and so like when they come to brain trust, literally the same exact person, they can hire four or five times as many people for the same amount of money. Hmm. And so for, for these large companies that are rapidly trying to innovate, they need high quality talent. They need lots of them. And if their budgets can now go four or five times as far, listen, that's a real, that's a real innovation for them. And we, and frankly, we only charge them a 10% fee. So if the engineer is billing at $75 an hour, they would, we would be adding 10% to that. The enterprise pays a 10% fee, which is like, it's a de minimis amount for them. And we handle all the global taxes and cross-border payments and things like that. So there's no incentive for either side to disintermediate or go off platform. Got it. So there is a revenue model in the form of taking a percentage of the transactions, but yeah. it's small compared to traditional it's small it's on the employer side so it's 10 percent, and then then the question is like how do you survive on that right well in the old world like <laughs> well those companies never make any profit but um but in in the old web 2 markets it would hire armies of people to do 
all the different activities that a network needs. And they'd spend billions of dollars on Google AdWords and Facebook advertising and all these kind of like channels to acquire customers or to support them. The innovation here is replace the, so replace the middlemen with software and then use a token to incentivize community behavior, like inviting talent, inviting clients. So we've got almost 500 enterprises now. We've never spent a penny in advertising to get them. It comes from, from people referring those companies to the network and earning B trust for doing so. So the, the core innovation is essentially taking cost of acquisition to zero by giving away tokens to the people that are inviting you know, more talent and more, and more companies. You could imagine how fast an Uber or Airbnb would have grown if they had that kind of growth mechanic from the start. So that's, a, that's a long answer, but that's like a, that's, a, that's the big breakdown. Yeah. I want to break it down a little bit more because I think this is a new model that is novel and foreign to a lot of people. So I want to delve specifically into the token part of the network, which is completely new. So the B-Trust token <clears throat> you mentioned is earned by connectors who are referring talent and clients into the network. Um, do they also earn cash compensation for doing that? And then second part of the question is, is the B-Trust token also utilized to incentivize other participants like the talent or the clients in the network as well? Yeah, so um, the referral engine is a permission, like global permissionless system that rewards literally anyone who shows up and brings either talent or clients to the network. So that could be the connector user type, or it could be a talent, you know, bringing in, you know, folks in her network, or it could be clients referring other clients. We have all of the above. The most common is the connector that shows up. These are typically like talent recruiters, folks with big networks, um, and they come in, they get a unique code. When you go to braintrust.com and sign up, you, you get a unique code. And then anyone who ends up transacting after signing up with that code will get uh, the person who, whose code it is will get tokens uh, as a bonus. And it's a completely permissionless system. So anyone can do it. Um, you asked about cash comp. In that system, there is no cash comp. It's just tokens. Um, we, we have like, you know, various core teams that, you know, employ people who do this full time and part of their comp could be cash. That's kind of how we bootstrap the network. Um, but like the way the network scales is, you know, really that that token flywheel. Got it. Um, could you give us a sense of um, how people are regarding or reacting to this token model? Are they holding onto it? Do they view it as an investment and something they want to accrue more of? Do they sell it to pay for, you know, their living expenses? What are people actually doing with the token? Yeah, all the above. <laughs> um, but, but I'll tell you sort of the, the core use cases. So, um, the token is primarily earned by doing positive things on the network. So referring people like we've been talking about, bounty programs, um, you know, building stuff, doing marketing copy, like writing a, a blog post about your experience. You know, like, you know, when we were earlier and, and needed people to do this, like putting, you know, brain trust on your LinkedIn profile, that kind of stuff. And now it's sort of big enough to where we don't need to incent that behavior anymore. Um, and then so. So those folks then became part of the community and they started like kind of feeling real ownership of the network. They're active on Discord and Twitter and Telegram. Um, and so we have seen from what we can tell, we, we can't measure everything, but what we can track a lot of those people because they started on our platform. Um, the vast majority of them have been holding on to the tokens and using them to vote on snapshot, governance proposals, things like that. Um, there are, of course, speculators, you know, who just buy the token because they think it's going to change in price. Obviously, like nothing that's completely out of our control now that it's decentralized. Um, but but like, interestingly, a lot of the vast majority of these people aren't earning tokens as their primary income, right? Like a, a talent who earns tokens for doing good things on the network, they make money by servicing clients on the network, right? Goldman yeah. Sachs or Nike or whatever, right? So the tokens they get are really icing. And so we've seen a lot of sort of just accumulation there. The same with the connectors. The connectors are mostly like full-time recruiters or full-time, you know, they have like giant networks. So it costs them nothing to make an intro. And right. so they, they don't have to sell the token, right? That That's an important piece. I think that's a really appealing model for a lot of businesses who, you know, have founders that are 
maybe they're they originally started their company outside of a web3 context and they're like oh, i could see a way to integrate a token where we still have transactions flowing through our system using usd but there's this other token that could be used for governance and that's kind of like the icing sort of like way of putting it i'm curious like thinking about that even like you know for every for for my business like it seems like it would be a lot of work and you would need like people in house to be like writing smart contracts who are good at that. And like, you'd have to hire someone to audit it. Like, tell me about the operational complexity of like, it's hard enough just to build a talent network that like can service clients like Porsche. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of people see this and they're like, it sounds cool, but like, should I stay focused on sort of like just the core, like supply and demand thing and the product or whatever versus like getting in with the tokenomics or like making sure the smart contract is secure and all that seems like potentially a distraction. It was what I would guess a lot of people kind of have in their heads. So I'm curious, A, just like what does it take to kind of get set up on this? And then B, how did y'all think it through in terms of like why it's worth it to you? You know, the first thing is like, I think one of the one of the things that we believe from the very beginning is that it it has to be native, right? This yeah. isn't like a bolt on, um, which means that like th there is no equity in brain trust, right? Like the, the sole unit of, of ownership and governance and control is the brain trust token. So, oh, interesting. So brain trust isn't like, you know, a Dell or a C corporation. It's a token. Nope. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, same as Ethereum, right? It, it's, yeah. it, we, we exactly modeled it off Ethereum. Ethereum has many companies and individuals behind it, right? Consensus. And, uh, you know, you name it, right? Thousands, of, tens of hundreds of thousands of people that, that love and care about Ethereum. There's no Ethereum Inc. Right? right. And so brain trust is exactly the same way. There's thousands of individuals and in LLCs and Delaware companies, whatever, that are contributing in some way. Yeah. And so I think that the follow on to that, which is, the, um, I guess, a different way that we had approached it um, in the beginning. And I think we we took a lot of heat for this in the beginning and maybe sometimes still do, but it, but we, it was a very intentional decision, which is that like one, we wanted this to be native and two, like we actually wanted to um, prove product market fit and prove demand and supply and actually have real network transaction volume flowing through the system um, before you started to like, I'll say like release the token on mainnet and do governance and that sort of thing. And that, that was an observation after like Adam and I both being investors in the crypto space um, and also like being advisors and watching a lot of the development. It, it, it did seem like there was um, a lot of projects that never got off the ground because they couldn't all agree and they couldn't all like coordinate. Um, so they started basically like by publishing a white paper, but then it just like never got any further than that. Right. And, like, we we published a white paper when we when we launched on mainnet. So it was a very different decision where we went out and actually built supply and demand early to prove the that people actually really wanted to use this network, and then like you know went through a went through a, a little bit of a different process. And I think depending on what kind of network and product you're building, you you know you may need to be on chain from the very beginning, like some of these DeFi projects. And then there's other things that just don't require that from the very beginning. So. I'm just curious if there's no brain trust ink, then like who I, I'm sure there's stuff that's like off chain that you need to like, there's like legal liability and like, how does it, how does all that work? Yeah, absolutely. So this is like, I would say one of the more interesting, I'm, I'm glad you asked about this. Like it's um, one of the more unique aspects of the brain trust network is art. The, the concept of a node on brain trust is a, real world commercial entity like a Delaware C Corp or something that brings clients onto the network. Okay. And, and so, because Goldman Sachs is not going to onboard itself to a bunch of smart contracts on Ethereum. Right. And, and so in, in Goldman Sachs needs to see professional liability insurance, like you just said, Nathan, totally. um, you know, people who aren't on the uh, OFAC sanctions list, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and also like someone to process fiat revenue, right? Like right. there's, you know, Goldman pays its bills, by US wire transfer or ACH. And that's how it's gonna be for a while. Um, you know, not everyone's gonna get on, jump on the USDC rails just yet, hopefully soon, right? I mean, that would be amazing if, if we could just get rid of Stripe and TransferWise tomorrow. Um, I hope they're not listening. We really love those services and appreciate them deeply. Um, but USDC is Stripe's easier. working on crypto. They know what the deal is. Yeah, no, I know. They're, <laughs> Probably TransferWise too. They're, they're all great companies, but, um, and so, you know, there have to be real world companies, not not smart contracts to handle that, right? To bridge 
crypto to non-crypto. And so that's what a brain trust node does. And and okay. we and we actually had like there was six core teams actually that that started working on brain trust from the beginning. And now each of those core teams is a node and we'll have many more nodes coming on. But a node's job is basically to do what you just said, to facilitate that online to offline uh, thing. Hmm. That's cool. And then the node the, the node gets the 10%. Sorry, that that's the la- the missing piece of the puzzle there. The the, the node takes the 10% fee and that, that they're supposed to uh maintain gotcha. there. Yeah. So it's kind of like a headless franchise model almost. There's totally. like no central corporation. There's like a protocol and anyone could it, I mean that's that's basically what it is to run a you know a Bitcoin node or an Ethereum node is uh you know there's a protocol you adhere to and there's an economic model to incentivize you to run it and it's but it's an open template that anyone can conform to rather than something you have to license from someone. You got it man. That's exactly right. Something that I'd love to discuss with you guys is the concept of ownership in people's minds. Um, so as you guys know, um, I and the entire firm that I invest um, as a part of Variant Fund, we've been really um, investing against the thesis of the ownership economy and the idea that next generation platforms and services are going to be user owned, like Brain Trust. I think one of the common pushbacks or misconceptions that we get is people don't care about ownership. They don't know what it is. They would just prefer to get money, income. Um, And I've experienced this sometimes myself when I'm telling creators why they should be angel investing in startups versus just creating content on those platforms. Um, And so I'd love to get your thoughts on this topic. And was there a lot of education that was required to get people in the network to even care about the B-Trust token and the marketplace being user owned? Yeah, I think there's there are probably two different spots to to dig into this one. The one thing I would say would um, would be that when we were designing this network, um, the idea was that you didn't have to actually care about the token. Um, it, what you weren't saying, I'm going to take tokens instead of U.S. dollars, mm. right? Like the, mm-hmm. when Goldman Sachs pays, like we did a hundred customer development interviews before we did seed round. And like Goldman Sachs doesn't want to buy the B-Trust token and and the developer doesn't want to receive that. They can't pay for rent or milk or anything that they need in their lives. So to back to Adam's point before, it's really icing on the cake. And people can just show up and earn 30 or 40% more on our platform. And companies can just show up and hire incredible talent. And I think one of the one of the things that's been incredible is actually that we've abstracted away a lot of the like what I would call kind of crypto brand da- brain damage, and, it's, and and in the process we've enabled a whole new set of transactions to come onto the blockchain, which is this is sometimes like Nike, Goldman Sachs, Nestle, like this is their first time using a crypto network, and they don't even know that they're actually interacting with a crypto network, and I think that if you project this out a little bit more. Like that's how it's going to work. Like people use the internet every single day and they don't even know that they're using X protocol or Y protocol. Yeah. And so I think for the next generation of, of you know, crypto projects to reach scale, they have to actually like, you guys have installed MetaMask and used it for different things. You guys have used all these different crypto tools and like, it's great for early adopters, but like the UI, the UX, like it's got to improve dramatically to be able to get this next wave of adoption. And so that's been what we've tried to do is essentially make it very easy to use for both sides. And then for people that wanna go deeper and earn B-Trust and participate in governance and like and participate in the on-chain discussions, they can do that, uh, but they don't have to. I, I, th- I think one more sort of point to underscore, you know, Gabe laid it out nicely. Like, I think it's a flaw in a token economy if, you're using your governance token and your utility token as a payment layer, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're being paid for your time in something, um, just assume it's going to get converted to dollars, right? Because like people can't live off crypto for today. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and so if you're designing a token that is just going to automatically be sold and to pay for rent or whatever, what's the point, right? Like we'll just use dollars. With, with brain trust, it's not about being paid in the token. The token is a reward 
incentive mechanism. I think of it another way, like, you know, it, when you have a, a flywheel, a marketplace is rely on strong flywheels, right? Strong network effects. Those, those stages in the flywheel could get friction and tokens can be used to grease the friction and make the flywheel turn better. I'll give you an example. Uh, creating a profile on a new talent network and like in importing your work history and saying, you know, where you've worked and what you've done and uploading your portfolio if you're a visual designer or whatever. It takes time, right? There's effort there. So it's a friction point. So on Braintrust, you might get some tokens for getting past that, you know, getting to your profile to 100% complete. Um, it, you know, there are tons of uses for the token that aren't like compensatory, right? right. And so, so if you design a token economy that doesn't rely on the token being sold, well, then like now you can actually, people don't have to sell it and they can actually express their views about how the future of the network should work with that token. And so that was the cool part. Like we, we when the, our token finally hit mainnet and was liquid on Coinbase, we saw folks actually just like voting with it and proposing it and, you know, using it for what we wanted it to be used for instead of just immediately dumping it. Right, right. I'm curious, like how, I mean, this is, this is maybe slightly technical, but I'm just interested in it. Like architecturally, how do you give people coin? Do they just like tell you when they sign up, here's my like Ethereum wallet address. And then you have like, you know, a web app that's like, send this token to this person because they did something off chain basically. Yeah. Yes. Good, good question, Nathan. It's, um, so we have a, um, an off chain layer that with a platform wallet, right? So okay. let's say Nathan comes on, he gets his code, you know, his referral code, and then he refers some great Python engineers and those folks end up transacting. They sign up, they transact at Goldman hires them to do Python work. Um, the system can track it through Nathan's thing and then puts say a thousand tokens into Nathan's platform wallet. This is all automated, right? There's no mm -hmm. people. Um, and then Nathan gets an email. Hey, Nathan, you've got, you know, a thousand tokens on the brain trust platform. Like come on over and, and withdraw them if you like, or you can keep them on the platform. Uh, you can vote with them, you know, whatever you want. Um, and so that, that whole system is, is automated. Gotcha. Okay. So basically it's almost like, uh, you can transfer it to your sort of like sole custody bank account. Like you can get the dollar bills from the bank almost and put them in your safe if you want, like your hardware wallet or whatever. Um, or you could just keep it with y'all and it's like, technically the coins are in some, you know, account on, on the, on the Ethereum blockchain that like belongs to you or the node, I guess. Um, but you trust the node that th if they say that you've got 20 or a hundred or whatever of these coins that they're not going to like allocate it to someone else. Exactly. Right. Yeah. The, gotcha. the, the platform stays synchronized with the blockchain in that way. Cool. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. I want to zoom out <clears throat> a little bit and sort of give a more lay of the land as well as just sort of explain to our listeners um, the scale of things that are happening right now. So Recently, you guys were mentioned in The Economist in a piece by Chris Dixon and Packy McCormick, where they wrote, quote, Web3 applications are wresting market share from centralized incumbents. Brain Trust, a Web3 talent marketplace that incentivizes participants with tokens, works with employers including Deloitte, NASA, Nike, and Porsche, and it's gaining ground on public competitors such as Upwork. So I want to put that um, into specific numbers. So according to the latest growth report, on the Brain Trust website, um, in October, uh, Brain Trust processed three point three million dollars of sales. Um, there's been sixteen hundred plus jobs posted on the platform to date, and the entire talent network numbers over thirty thousand participants. To put that into context, Upwork currently has around one hundred forty thousand clients and has processed two and a half billion dollars in payments. So I'd love to hear you guys speak to, you know, what is necessary in terms of what needs to happen, whether that's technologically, societally, um, culturally, for people to opt for these decentralized marketplaces, or are there some of some hurdles that we need to overcome first for that to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think that's um, one very fortunate thing in this particular case is that there there is some I'll say like 
demographic and societal shifts that are underway that are kind of, I would say like winds at our, at our backs. Like one of those is, is like what we call like the unbundling of corporate America, which means that like people that are working at these jobs, this, this happened, it was already happening. People going freelance and it moved forward by a decade during COVID right. when people realized, wow, I don't have to like commute two hours a day and go and sit in an office at a job that I hate. And now I can work in my house. So that, that whole movement of like people unbundling, like unbundling to work at home gave way to the great resignation. Right. And all of those are forces that, that play directly into brain trust. Um, and so I think that we're very fortunate to be in a category where you have these like shift, societal shift to working at home and also a great resignation and unemployment rates being at record lows. And what that does is it creates a, a, a demand within large enterprises that I would say never existed before, certainly in my lifetime, which is they were already struggling to find technical talent and, and in this battle with Google and Facebook. And now they've had people resigning and they have been forced to basically go outside of their four walls to be able to find people. And then the question is like, where do they go? And so both on the supply side and the talent side and on the enterprise side, there's huge like societal and demographic forces that are creating this like very unique window in time. Now, like sprinkle on crypto, <laughs> which is like has, has captivated people's hearts and minds right now. I think this was a much more difficult story for us to tell a year ago or, or two years ago when we first started. <clears throat> now it, everyone is interested. Like yes. everyone wants to learn about it. And so when you get those convergence of those three things, like timing is everything when you build a, when you build a, a startup or a company. And I think we've been very fortunate to be, you know, right business model at the right time. Uh, a, a few other r remarks there um, to, to build on the, the macro painting that, that Gabe just gave us. Lee, I, I would argue the technological innovations required for this have already occurred. Right. It's it's the layer ones, the smart contract platforms, whether you're on Ethereum or Solana, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, the um, it's now about, you know, that that token replacing shares of a for profit company was the major innovation. It was a it is a business model innovation powered by a technical innovation. And it's already happened. And now the future just has to catch up. And so. Um, if you think about, you mentioned Upwork's numbers and, you know, but, but we're talking about global knowledge work, right? Like Brain Trust is, plays in a, a narrow, but very deep category of, of technical of IT outsourcing, essentially. It's 1.5 trillion a year, global IT outsourcing. Of that 1.5 tr trillion, Upwork is like half a basis, you know, half a point or something. Um, Upwork, Fiverr, LUT, and, and, and Brain Trust and networks like us. Um, the big piece, is employment, right? Whether that's staffing firms, consulting firms, or, or good old fashioned W-2, that's where everyone spends their time, right? That's how everyone gets their paycheck. They're twisted in with healthcare and health insurance and all this stuff. And so that's, and that's, you know, where a lot of the, you know, the margin and waste, whatever you want to call it, is sort of buried, right? And so that's when we come back to this point Gabe mentioned earlier of unbundling corporate America is, the, you know, it turns out like nobody wanted to go back to work, right? To back to the office. Why? Because it sucks. Because commuting sucks. Because cubicles suck. Office culture sucks for the most part. We all miss being with each other physically, obviously, right? But like what what we had before February of, or March of 2020 was no fun and nobody wanted to go back. And so what what now, like what the demands are now are flexibility, I mean, be it geographic or time-based, and um, uh, specialization, right? Like a lot of full-time employees, like maybe they like 20 or 30% of their job and the other shit they just have to eat because they, they need the paycheck, right? But what, what unbundling out of that does in, in becoming your own boss or freelancer, it allows you to work when you want, from where you want, on what you want, at your rate. What was the problem before? There were a bunch of things that had to happen to make this possible. One of them was broadband. The other was Zoom. The, uh, sauna, Google Docs, whatever, right? Um, but the big one is demand. Where's the money going to come from? 
right? Mm-hmm. Gabe's point earlier, like the you freelancer can't just pitch Goldman Sachs and just get a contract and onboard through a year of procurement and like, oh, now I contract for Goldman Sachs. It just doesn't work that way. And so what Brain Trust aims to serve is providing the demand for freelancers. And so now a, a talent can just show up on Brain Trust and say, hey, look, I'm a designer. Uh, I want to, you know, I'll, I'll do great UX. And, but like, I'm only going to do it when I want and I'm going to be traveling the world. I'm going to be a nomad. Oh, and I want 200 bucks an hour. So it is what it is. And Brain Trust has, it uh, turns out, unlimited demand for visual designers. So if you're listening to this and you're a designer, come sign up. So, so, so that, in, in the reason why we're able to aggregate that demand is because it's a no fee model, right? Or the yeah. 10% is de minimis. So that's, right, that's the magic of Web3, right? Brain Trust is a, it's just one little corner of this. Um, when you can cut the rake down, bring two parties together, and not get in the way, um, you know that you get you 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 can uh, actually unbundle the trillions of dollars of the the W two stack. I think the timing in terms of crypto awareness, even if people haven't yet adopted, but the fact that the entire world now knows and is curious, is a very critical element of this because I think even just a year ago or two years ago it may have been too early just culturally for people to understand what it means to have a token. Well, and so we, we know we raised a round in 2018 uh, and, and people yeah. told us to like start a woman's shoe business or start an Indian <laughs> restaurant. They said, just don't do this. This is just like a terrible idea. Yeah. Why would you ever want to drop the rake to zero and give away ownership and control to the users? And so uh, that was the height of kind of like, the last real crypto winter. Now crypto winters right. last like two weeks, but can you well, really quick before you keep going? I'm confused about the rake thing. So is it ten percent or zero? There's something I'm missing. It's, it's yeah. zero to talent and ten to clients. Does that is that a meaningful distinction? Because like, I feel like rakes are rakes. Like it's just comes from somewhere. Well, it, it is because um, if you look at Upwork's rake, they'll charge uh, you know fifteen, twenty to twenty five percent to talent, and then another five to ten to clients. Right. And it's sort of this weird mismatch. Uh-huh. Um, and so that sort of like artificially depresses what talent take home with brain trust. It's like, hey, you know, the talent shows up. Hey, I, I think I'm worth 150 bucks an hour. Cool. But list yourself 150 bucks an hour. And, sure. you know, it's, it's it, brain trust is a decentralized marketplace for matching talent and clients. The same way Uniswap is a decentralized exchange for matching bidders and askers. Right. Right. You're just you're clearing the same thing, just different assets, uh, right, in right, different right. dimensions, I guess. But like, I just think of it like there's a flow of money. And so if like a, someone pays one hundred dollars, like, do I get one hundred dollars or do I get ninety? And it sounds like I get ninety. Well, if you charge one hundred dollars an hour, you make one hundred dollars an hour. If you charge one hundred dollars an hour. Right. If I charge one hundred dollars an hour, then the client has to pay one hundred and ten dollars. Exactly. Right. So I, I don't know. Maybe I'm done, but I think of it like 10 percent rake rather than zero rake. Yeah, I, I think that um, maybe the context for what people are used to paying or uh-huh. the context for the current environment is important there. And it's sure. like, it, it is a little splitting hairs. Like, yes, it, mm-hmm. it's 10% rake to the enterprise. They're used to paying 5x multiples. It was like a 500% rake. Oh, yeah, totally. I'm not saying you're screwing people over on the, on the rake. I'm just saying like yeah. the zero rake thing was just confusing to me because I'm like, oh, is their economic model like you hold a bunch of the tokens and then maybe one day you'll like sell them off or whatever, or like how else do you make money? But it's like, no, there is. And I'm glad there's a rake because that feels a lot more sustainable than things like Axie Infinity where there's no real economic transfer happening. The reason that it's important is that for a lot of these, for a lot of other marketplaces, they mask that and they don't, they don't show right. either side what they're spend what they're paying in terms of rake. And totally. so it's really important that we say there is zero rake for talent and 10% sure. for enterprises. And it's super clear and transparent. And there's not like a bunch of hidden fees or things like that for either side. Yeah. Th- th- think about the fees on Uniswap, right? I mean, like the, those Uniswap fees go to the liquidity providers, right? Like the liquidity providers are an important part of that marketplace. Yes. And importantly, it's minimally extractive. It's it's probably yeah. the lowest possible yeah. take rate that is possible. But I'm glad it's extractive to some extent. Because again, like if there was some sort of like token Ponzi thing going on, then that would suck. And there are a lot of people that are doing things kind of similar to that. And a rake that makes the business sustainable is like for, for like paying people to do a valuable part that needs to happen in an ongoing way, like be in the middle between them. Anyway, it's good. It's awesome. 
I wanted to get your thoughts, Adam and Gabe, on do you think all marketplaces are going to go this direction of having a token, giving over ownership, um, enabling users to participate in governance? Do you think there's some marketplaces that should or will stay centralized? So I, I go back to my spectrum on this on this question because it's a great like, hey, what is what will be eaten by Web3 when and how, right? It's like, and so I go back to my spectrum of maximally ex extractive, like extracting more value than you provide marketplaces all the way to the providing as, as much value as you extract. The folks on the maximally extractive end of the spectrum are going to be disrupted first, right? And so, um, so I would say Airbnb probably looks the same now in 10 years as it does now, except bigger. Mm -hmm. Right. B because they really do a good job of providing as much value as they're taking through the fee. On the other side, where you have, you know, on the gig economy or in the knowledge worker economy, like no one likes Upwork. Right. Like they, they hate the fees on there. Or if, if a big job comes on Upwork, the, the folks will just the town will just take them off platform. Right. And then Upwork loses that revenue, that GSV. You have a strong incentive to disintermediate because Upwork doesn't really provide much value there past the initial match. Right. And I'm, not, I'm picking on Upwork. It's true for all Web2 talent marketplaces. And so um, the ones that are I, so I think knowledge worker marketplaces and staffing firms that take the like PwC, Accenture, et cetera, that take these big chunks are very uh, susceptible to Web3 disruption. That's not in the knowledge worker field. Switch to the gig economy, sort of the physical worker. I call it the last mile economy, delivering people packages and food. Those are highly extractive networks to the talent. If right. it's a three-sided marketplace like DoorDash, it's 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 awful to the to the user. I'm sorry, it's awful to the delivery person. It's awful to the restaurant, and it's you know the consumer likes it. So if if one or two of your of sides of your marketplace hate you because you're you're taking too much value from them, fields wide open for disruption. So I so I think inside of five years we'll see Web three tokenized driver networks restaurant networks, last mile networks, as well as the knowledge worker networks. Yeah. An interesting detail that you mentioned there is that the consumer likes it. So a lot of these very extractive marketplaces were extractive on the supply side, but a lot of people joked that they were, you know, subsidized adulthood for the consumers who were living in San Francisco. Venture capital subsidized adulthood um, was the joke because the prices that consumers would pay for their grocery delivery or taking an Uber were actually lower than what they should have been in a sustainable marketplace. And so it feels like it's necessary. The, the thesis has to be like, by extracting so much from the supply, that is not a sustainable situation. The supply is going to move elsewhere, thus pulling the demand. Wherever the supply goes, the demand goes. I, I, we, we like to use this kind of easy framework. Like the Web 2 playbook was raise hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, use that money to subsidize one or both sides of the marketplace. What you just said, Lee, giving dollar bills away for 75 cents. Get liquidity if you're lucky enough to break orbit. Most didn't. But if, you, if you're lucky enough, you've got strong network effects. Start ra start uh, ramping up the rake. Listen to any of the earnings calls of these of these companies. They, all they they tell you <laughs> we're raising fees, we're increasing the rake. Why? Because it's their job. They're for profit companies, right? The rake increases. Uh, it, it pisses off users. It erodes network effects. Hopefully, they can pay the investors back. In the gig economy's case, they'll never pay the investors back, right? Like those, unless you were obviously early in them. But right, those companies have proven they cannot generate cash, even in the best scenarios. Right. DoorDash only was profitable that one quarter where the whole world shut down, you know, like they're awful companies to begin with. So the Web3 playbook, it just inverts all of those things. Raise barely any money, get your users involved in ownership and control early and often and keep the rake super low. So lots of valuable transactions can hit the network. And, and it's not a profit mechanism, right? There's the token's not returning a dividend because there is no profit. It's the to the, the network's job is to connect folks, facilitate the, the connection and get out of the way, maintain reputation and blah, blah, blah. But like once the connection has been made, why do you need to keep extracting so much value? Right. That's the magic of Web3. How do you capture the value that you create? Because I guess since there's no Brain Trust Inc., do you all just run like one node out of, I think you said like seven or something that exists? 
And like if somebody else comes and most of the value in the future is created by people who own other nodes, then it's like kind of like Tim Berners-Lee kind of situation where it's like how much value rides on the rails of HTTP and like HTML a lot, but like, you know, Tim Berners-Lee didn't capture very much of it. Um, like, so is there, did you, do you raise money for the specific node that y'all run the like kind of one out of seven or how, how does that, how does that work for y'all like as founders? Yeah, the, the, the early um, rounds, the seed round um, and the one last year were, were basically to bootstrap the network. Um, and then anything else would be just to just to grow community, you know, grow the protocol overall. Uh, but what you I mean, so you asked what's in it for me, like this is my passion project. I'm like get to start, you know, help start a found a, a protocol that, you know, is looking like it'll be like an important protocol for work uh, in the future. You know, it's um, imagine if, you know, Dixon always says this, like, imagine if you could have owned a piece of SMTP right. back in the day or HTTPS, like you just said. Yeah. Um, that's kind of, you know, it's, it's now you can. But essentially, so the, the in terms of what's in it for founders, obviously there's, there's the mission, but also typically the model is that founders would retain a portion of the tokens, the token supply in this case, be trust, which then functions as um, their exposure to the growth to and of the, to, yes, yeah. to the price of the token. Yeah, you got it. I mean, the, the price of the token obviously is, you know, can be whatever it is, right? It's sort of, you know, the, the very volatile thing, but um, the utility of the token is not dependent on its price, right? And so that's kind of like, like if you like, it, I, I think there's an interesting exercise, thought exercise to be had around like, what, how do you value web three networks? I don't know, like what, what is like f a piece of uh, scarce control of a network where so many people make their living? What is that worth? And I'm asking this rhetorically. I don't have the answer to this, right? Um, right, because there's only 250 million, you know, fixed supply brain trust tokens. Um, and if you have so many tens of thousands, eventually millions of people making their living there, and the token, that token is the way, the only way to upgrade and change the protocol and or protect it from change. What is that worth? You know, it's it's an interesting framework that I think hopefully uh, someone will build. I'd love to wrap up with predictions on the future. Um, for both of you guys. Um, I'd love for you guys to share thoughts and predictions on what the future of work looks like over the next 10 years. I think like to, in order to look forward, sometimes it's helpful to look in, in the rears. Um, and like, if we go back in the, in the rewind machine, we could say like, well, people were all entrepreneurs, like solopreneurs in the, in the days when like people were cobblers, people had, were seamstresses. Right. And, the, and what gave rise to the firm was transaction costs, basically the cost of organizing and processing transactions of all different types as an individual operator was, was, um, was so great that forming essentially a firm to process transactions as an entity was this great efficiency. And that model that like, I'll say that that like large lumbering giant model has continued to work for a very long time. And then what you're seeing now, both with the advent of the internet and also, uh, you know, innovations like smart contracts, is basically the the costs of transacting as an individual have gone down dramatically. Whether that's like processing invoices, there's free software for that, right? Like you now have a global free distribution platform for your ideas, the internet. Um, and so the costs of transacting as an individual have gone down so much. And we also now have a global distribution platform to basically source demand for whatever our specialty is, whether that's blogging or writing code or, or designing or making t-shirts, whatever it may be. And so what that enables is for people to actually kind of go back to the way in which it was. Um, and, and, I, and that's what we're seeing right now. So I think actually we're going to see this trend of the great resignation and, and like the form of these solopreneurs and creators accelerate dramatically um, across all categories. I, I also think like th this unbundling we're talking about will really have accelerated by, you know, 10 years. I, I think the, like the corporate America that we know now will cease to exist. I think not, I, I hope all workers, but I can just attest to knowledge workers will be able to specialize, have ultimate flexibility, work from when they want, where they want, take months at a time off, 
Um, there will be offices still because we all still like want to see each other, but it'll be like probably WeWork style stuff, right? Where you or or you know maybe the companies still have big campuses, but you like you know they're all hot desks or whatever, um, and and you can just float around, and and as long as you're like doing a good job, you know you're you're getting paid. But this like kind of corporate hierarchy, we, I think it moves from these hierarchies to actual networks. Got it. So basically, the dissolution of the firm. Um, everyone able to be a freelancer, do work on their own terms, on their own time, flexing up and down the types of work that they want to do and essentially being way more autonomous and independent. I think that that is so appealing to so many people, especially the, the younger generations, that it, they'll, they'll, you know, the world will be forced to move in that direction. Um, yeah. And not to mention like the dis- dissolution of you know, um, anachronistic firms, right? I mean, look at DAOs. I mean, DAOs are in its little, they're just infant phase here, but so much potential for that, for that structure replacing kind of a traditional C-Corp. I think based on the survey data, this prediction is backed up by what people say they actually want. So I do hope that people get what they want, which is this kind of work. So um, I can get behind that. And thank you guys so much for coming on today. Really interesting conversation. Loved hearing more about Ray Trust and really excited to see how this all plays out in the future. Well, thanks for well, having we're, us. Uh, we're big fans of the show. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you.